Hey guys, Hardware Hound here. I'm gonna do a video that has been something I've been wanting to do for a while and, you know, kind of answer some questions. So we're gonna talk about chipsets and what really separates them. So if you're here and you're like, well, I wanna know what chipset I want to get for my 7700K or my 1800X Ryzen chip, this probably isn't the video for you. You can Google search that really easily, figure out, okay, this chipset for this processor, done and done. But if you're like me, you may have wondered, well, you know, this processor gives me this performance compared to this processor that gives me that performance, but will, the, will my motherboard selection change some of the performance there? How will that affect what kind of features would I get if I choose a chipset over a different chipset versus maybe a processor over a processor. Now, generally speaking, your processor is going to be your performance king. It's gonna be the primary impact of your performance, but there's a lot of info out there. So when I first started out on this whole endeavor, I figured this wouldn't be too terribly hard. I was like, ah, it's okay. I'll do some quick Google searches, throw some charts together. <laughs> oh man. Turned out finding the information that I wanted was quite a bit more complicated. So one of the other big questions I wanted to pull is, is why does Intel release a new chipset every year? Maybe there's a good reason. I mean, it seems like it's kind of pointless, but maybe there is a good reason and I was gonna go find that out. As well as finding out how some of the differences between AMD and Intel. So I'm gonna put the charts up overlaid on this video so you can see the direct comparisons, but I'm only gonna highlight some key factors. Now, first off, let me talk about the categories here. So the socket is of course the type of socket that the uh, chipset is actually using. The graphics slash expansion support is the number of PCIe lanes that this chipset uses to put actual expansion cards in. Then of course the DRAM is the supported DRAM frequency from the chip manufacturer. Motherboards will support more than these frequencies, but they are always considered overclocks. Even if the RAM is factory set to handle that speed, the processors will register that as an overclock. Then we're gonna look at how many channels and DIMMs per channel the board has, the total number of USB options that, that, the, that are come built into the motherboard, even though there's options to use additional PCIe lanes, which we're coming to too, how many native SATA 3 ports there are, Additional PCIe is the amount of additional lanes that the manufacturer puts into the chipset and processor so that vendors can add their own extra, say, SATA ports or maybe an extra M2 drive or an additional built-in wireless card. So that's what the additional PCIe lanes is for. We'll look at how many M2 and SATA Express supports, which are usually shared across the same PCIe lane they can support, and whether the motherboards have Optane support. So first let's talk about AMD and where they've come from. AMD was on the 990FX chipset for so long and so there was a couple of things that were going on. Now they had a decent number of support for, for expansion cards on PCI lanes, but they were only supporting Gen 2. And Intel quickly moved past that to Gen 3. So even though we had up to two times 16 support for graphics cards or four times eight, which is a total of 32 lanes there. And there was actually, I think a total of 40 on the, on the entire chipset, though some of those lanes were used for other things. They're only Gen 2s versus the Gen 3s. And so that kind of hampered some of the performance gains that you would have benefited from having the additional lanes. Of course, our DDR standard was only DDR3 back then. We only really natively supported 2.0 ports, though, you know, once again, we had an extra few PCI lanes. But it looks like the extra PCI lanes were supported through the Southbridge chipset, which was very commonly for the 990FX, the SB940. So, there was four extra lanes that you could use to do some additional parts, but it, you can see it was a very old platform. It's very hampered. It was no wonder that AMD had such problems. So with the X370, granted we only have um, one full 16 lane that we can use for graphics cards, or it's gonna down it to two times eight if you do Crossfire SLI, but they are gen three lanes. 
We jumped up to a massive DDR4 2400 MHz support built into the processor. And then we also upgraded to USB 3.1 Gen 2 and Gen 1 support built in. So we got some pretty nice upgrades as well as an additional 8 PCIe 2.0 lanes that the manufacturers can add additional parts to. On top of that, we natively support two M2 drives with the X370. Pretty big upgrade, but then if we look at the Threadripper, here's where Threadripper thrives. It is meant for tons and tons of expansion, and you can see that. 20 supported USB lanes so that you can plug tons of devices in. We have 4 times 16, so 64 slots. Now I'm not sure where that, where that totally falls. I saw 66 and 64 on AMD's um, site. They also mentioned that they use four lanes for communication among the devices. So you may only have around 60 or 62 actual lanes towards the PCI expansion cards. That's still a ton of lanes for expansion, whether you're using graphics cards for mining or P NVMe drives for data, for you know very fast RAID 10 level data storage. Of course, we also have quad channel RAM at two DIMMs per channel that we can support for a total of eight sticks of RAM. So that platform was meant to be used for massive amounts of expansion and additional devices. Now, if we look at Intel, they've got a similar thing going on. Now their X99 and X299 chipsets, you can see Overall, we've got pretty similar PCI setups. Both were using Gen 3 and kind of the same configurations, but we did get a massive boost in DDR4 capability with up to 2666 megahertz RAM. Of course, our USB stayed the same, but Intel, when they went to X299, added a massive 24 PCIe lanes of 3.0 so that vendors could add their own components to use up those lanes. That could be equal more storage, more M2 slots, so on and so forth. The old X99 chipset only had eight. And of course, X299 looks like it comes with three native M2 drives, which is useful for people who like to do heavy storage workloads. So the X99 jump to X299 made a lot of sense. And you can see that the X299 does have some advantages compared to AMD, but AMD's Threadripper has some advantages too on the motherboard. If you're trying to do like, crypt, like mining um, cryptocurrencies, that Threadripper platform is going to be a shoe in for that with that massive amounts PCI lanes. So finally, let's look at the enthusiast chipsets. So back in the Z97 days, we had an 1150 socket. So Intel went to the seven Z170 chipset and they added one pin to the socket. And that seemed kind of pointless. It's like, why can't you just guys use the same socket? But, all right, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Our PCIe lanes stayed the same, but we did jump up from DDR3 support to DDR4 up to a standard of 2133 megahertz. Now, boards can overclock that, but that's what would be considered standard without overclocking by Intel standards. Of course, our memory stayed the same. We got um, a little extra USB 3.0, which is nice. But here's where Intel took such a huge leap. We went from eight PCI 2.0 lanes to 20 PCIe 3.0 lanes built in the chipset. This gave manufacturers huge amounts of opportunity to add all kinds of additional expansion devices, built-in wireless cards, M2, so on and so forth. But the question comes is, is that really necessary for a consumer platform? We do have uh, native support for three M2 or SATA Express devices, which is nice, but how many consumers are buying three M2 NVMe drives and throwing them into their gaming rig? Probably not a lot. So then as we look at Z270 and Z370, we can kind of see that a lot of this hasn't changed much. We've got a few improvements in numbers and our DDR4 has improved, but that's not a lot, which begs the question, why is the new processors that Intel is releasing not supporting the Z170 chipset? Now granted, the Z270 didn't at first, but then after a little bit of backlash, Intel kind of reneged and they put Skylake and Kaby Lake support on both the Z170 and Z270. But Coffee Lake right now is only supposed to support Z370, with the explanation being that the pinouts had to change slightly because of the additional cores. Unfortunately, I don't know if that's true because WCCF had an article showing that a site managed to hack the BIOS 
and they were able to get a coffee-like chip to work on a Z170 chipset. I went into this endeavor thinking maybe Intel had good reason not to do backward support. I came away feeling like, no, I don't think they really have a good reason. I think it's all monetary to them. And it's, that's a little sad because I feel like it would be better for consumers if they had backward support. But overall, I hope my information is helpful. So take a look. You can pause my video. Look at those graphs. This will give you a hopefully a detailed look at the chipsets. I'm about 85% sure that all my information is correct. It was really hard to pull all this together and really verify that it was 100% correct. So if you see some things that you can point out and say, hey, no, this is the actual support, put it in the comments below. I'd be more than glad to see it. Anyway, I hope this video is helpful. I hope you enjoy it. Like and subscribe to my channel if you do, and I will catch you later.